This week on The Anxious Truth, we are talking about how two very different paths can lead to the very same anxiety destination. I have special guest Jen Kirkman on the podcast, so let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast number 198, 198. We are recording at the end of February 2022. If you are new to the podcast, I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that focuses on all things anxiety and anxiety recovery. So if you're struggling with things like panic attacks or panic disorder, agoraphobia, OCD, social anxiety, health anxiety, this is the place to be. I'm glad you're here. And of course, if you are a returning listener or viewer on YouTube, hey, YouTube, uh, welcome back. I'm glad you're here as always. Today, we're going to have a really interesting conversation about how people from very different backgrounds with different mindsets and different emotional and thinking styles can wind up in the exact same place with the same exact anxiety disorders. And we're going to have that conversation with my friend, Jen Kirkman. I guess she's my friend. We just met last week, but we've done two podcasts together. So now, yeah, we're BFFs now. So Jen, if you don't know her, which I bet a lot of you do, is got a tremendous life going on. She is a stand-up comic. She is an author. She is a TV writer. She is a performer. She is a podcaster. She's been all over the place. So there's a good chance you know Jen Kirkman already. But if you don't, you're going to get to know her today. She's really great. And she's going to talk about her anxiety journey. And she's going to laugh when she hears that because we've kind of both don't want to use the word journey anymore. We're going to talk about where she was and how she got into her anxiety situation and kind of compare it to me because we could not have been any different, but we wound up in the same place. And what does that tell us? So we're going to talk to Jen about that. She's going to talk about how she got better and what her life looks like now. It's a really great conversation. So let's get to it in a minute before we do. Uh, and I will give you all the details, by the way, and where to find Jen and her podcast, because she has a great podcast called Anxiety Bites. I'll have that at the end in the, in the details there. Uh, but yeah, before we do, I just want to remind you that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. There's a whole lot more. There's three books on anxiety and anxiety recovery. There's seven years worth of other podcast episodes. There's a ton of social media stuff. And there is my morning newsletter, email newsletter and podcast called The Anxious Morning. You can find all of that on my website at theanxioustruth.com. Go avail yourself of all the resources. I implore you. They're all there. Um, most everything is free. The books are even very inexpensive, and they're great books. And if you have them already and you're digging them, maybe write me some reviews on Amazon. So, yeah, check out all the stuff I have to offer on my website at theanxioustruth.com. So that little bit of housekeeping aside and bill paying aside, uh, let's get on with the interview with Jen. I'll be back at the end to wrap it up and give you all of her details and all the links and all the good stuff. So let's get to it. You're going to dig it. All righty. Jen Kirkman, welcome to the podcast. It's truly an honor to be here, Drew. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I, you have got to be just jam-packed every day. So I, I'm jam-packed every day because I have like a normal, I have a writing job, but it's like a normal, like go to work and be there all day. So you got me on a work from home day. So this is perfect. great. You that know how it out. is. It's like my life isn't busy, but when you can't like leave somewhere for eight hours a day. Oh, that's a whole different animal. You feel busier because you're doing stuff before and after work, but. You know, Very much. No different than anyone else. So what I want to talk about today, and for those of you um, who, you know, I mentioned in the intro and at the end of the episode, I'm going to give you all Jen's links and everything over to her podcast, which is called Anxiety Bites, which is such a good name. <laughs> I don't know. How come I didn't think of that? But <laughs> it's a great name. For it's, and you know, as a Gen Xer, you've got to appreciate it, that it's a uh, nod to the movie Reality Bites. A hundred percent. So, yeah. which leads us into today's topic. So for those of you who do not know Jen, Jen, give us like the Reader's Digest version of like, tell us your anxiety journey. Cause you know, you, you haven't told it already a hundred thousand times, but, but for folks. Yeah, I think that, I've gone down to something smaller. And by the way, you just said the word journey and I made fun of myself on my like podcast a and... journey. And then you're like, I do it all the time too. Um, yeah, basically had panic attacks since I was, I don't know, probably eight years old was the first one I remember. It had to do with being on an airplane. So that, uh, was mainly, you know, my first foray was a fear of flying and the panic attacks happened on airplanes. And then they started happening in other places, basically anything associated with travel or feeling trapped. Maybe if I was in the backseat of my parents' car on the way to grandma's and we were stuck in traffic on the highway, you know, um, then it started happening in tall buildings or not even buildings that were tall, but certain classrooms in my high school where just the angle of where I was sitting, I would look out the window and I wouldn't be able to see the ground. And honestly, only two stories up, you know, I probably could have fallen out the window and survived it, but I felt like I was high up and it just kept going and going from there. And I had probably generalized anxiety disorder. I'm sure I had a lot of 
behaviors that I look back on now that, oh, that seems like ADHD and that seems, you know, like a little bit of depression mixed in. And, and but my main things that kept me from living, I think the life I wanted to live and was meant to live were that, uh, were the uh, fear flying, the panic attacks, never had agoraphobia, but certainly could have kept going if things had kept going that way. Mm -hmm. Lots of fears of transportation, subways, driving on freeways, all that kind of thing. And so it just uh, got to a point where I decided I'll just live a small life and won't go anywhere ever. But obviously something inside of me was against that. So I did end up getting help and the help worked enough that it got me into sort of my own version of exposure therapy, which was not doing it with a therapist, but just having to do certain things and white knuckling it until I got used to it and on and on. So I don't know, that started at age eight and 47 now and uh, still, still learning. But all of, I can honestly say the huge, huge, huge panic attacks and panicking while traveling is really behind me in that it only happens sometimes. And when it does, it's fine. Yeah, that's great. I mean, clearly, I mean, I think for people listening, you're in New York right now, but clearly you're kind of living that two coast lifestyle, giving the industry that you're in and you're traveling a lot and, or maybe not for the last two years, but normally yes, it might exactly. be. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it just goes to show you, like, I'm sure that your panic attacks, you would have, I'm sure you would have described them as severe as anybody would describe their panic attacks. Everybody has the worst ones ever. We know that. Yep. But yet, but yet here you are. The thing that I dig about this, um, and I certainly don't dig that you have this problem, of course. I'm happy that you're better, which is great. But when I was on your podcast, you talked about the way you kind of got into this. So it starts with a fear of flying or a panic attack on an airplane. And then you're afraid of heights and you're afraid of this and you're afraid of that. And you described yourself in a very specific way. And, you know, a particular band came up that I'm not going to pick on. You know, I, I want to, but I won't. Um, you know, yeah, you I already picked on them on my podcast. And <laughs> I did. I'm going to let it go. But so I, I, what fascinates me about this is that we wound up in a very similar place and when you talk about now i became agoraphobic but draw anxiety driving on the highway getting too far from home like traveling all of those things so many people listening are going to relate to that but you got there coming from a very different place than i did yet we wound up in exactly the same place so talk about that a little bit like you described yourself as a certain way you were you know you were quite i think you were a bit emotional and you were in touch with that sort of stuff and yeah i mean that. i was a very dramatic kid and teenager, I would say, you know, the drama probably ramped up in my teenage years. So it's always hard to go back and go, what was teenage hormones and perspective and what was anxiety and depression. But definitely, definitely when I was a little kid, I did have a flair for the drama, but more in the fun way. Um, but then as I got to be a teenager, you know, I'm li listening to the Smiths and the Cure and, and honestly, I will just side note about the Smiths and Morrissey. <laughs> He actually has an amazing sense of humor. Now, what I like about that music is he's very sardonic and dark humor. And, uh, you know, I took it very literally when I was younger, you know, um, in terms of uh, I think more deeply than anyone else. And I need to get out of this town. And, you know, I want to wear all black and smoke cigarettes. You know, I wasn't a drug or drinking person. I wasn't a sports person. I was just you know, this literary kind of drama theater nerd and not even nerd, that, that's like a totally different thing, but like theater kid. And I hung out with a group of kids that the adults in town nicknamed us the freaks. And Ouch. it was just, it was just because we wore all black. And what was so funny is our hangout was the center of town. So how bad could we be if we were just standing <laughs> in the center of town for everyone to see? <laughs> but, um, you know, we wore our Doc Martens and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, but... I remember just, you know, honestly, I'm going to say this was a, a facet of the depression where if you're feeling different than other people, for me, I know that part of my story was, well, then I'm going to make it that I'm better than everyone else. You know, I can't just feel different and go, what the heck is this? I have to be better than everyone else. So I feel different. I feel sad. You know, everyone's kind of obsessed with boys. I mean, I have my crushes, but I don't know. And so I turned it into, I'm too deep of a thinker to care about what teenagers care about. I'm busy thinking about death. And so that's, I would go to the cemetery and, you know, ride my bike, listening to my Walkman with my depressing music and my all black. And I'd sit on the gravestones and write in my journal. And I'd write things that like, all these people had these lives and nobody notices as they drive by in their cars and they don't care. <laughs> and my friends are obsessed with dating and 
you know, I mean, yeah. all it was was a kid going, how come I'm not interested in normal things? Or why am I too afraid to put myself out there and ask a boy out or, you know, whatever. And as much as I had that side, I also was like really fun and, and was in like a punk rock band. You know, I was, I was, I right. was pretty cool, but I, I had this dark well, still are, side. As it turns out. I think I was cooler then. I've got to be totally honest. I'm not in a <laughs> punk band now. Um, but, but looking back on it, it's like, that was me very fixated on death. And it was totally from a fear of death, but I wonder if I was trying to, um, you know, move into any kind of acceptance in my own disordered way, but definitely thought about death a lot and was very convinced that I wouldn't live very long, not because I was so reckless and driving my car fast like James Dean, but that I was, um, that feeling I would get, those panic attacks. I wasn't sure what they were. And to me, they just felt like impending death. And so I thought, well, this must be something. And I bet whatever this is, I'm kind of getting the signal from the universe here. I'm not going to be around that long. So, yeah. And so your interpretation was, this is clearly an omen that I'm, you know, my time here is short. It would appear. Yes, it was an omen. It wasn't quite like, uh, you know, I know you've described in your book that it was really feeling like what it must feel like to be about to die, like right yeah. before you see the light. And so I'd had that experience so many times, I started to interpret it as kind of an omen. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. What's interesting about that is, and we come from I mean, we could not have been more different. So you were, you were Ali Sheedy in the Breakfast Club. No, everyone says that. But I never related to her because she was weird and antisocial. And I was loud and bombastic and, and did like the school musical and was kind of a goody two-shoes. Like I would never have been in detention. Yeah. Um, I was a combination of Brenda Walsh from 90210 and Winona Ryder from Beetlejuice. It was exactly that. Like I had a morbid streak. But I was at the end of the day, just kind of a dramatic person who just wanted to like smoke cigarettes and like low key okay. rebel, you know, yeah, low, rebel, but, but low key and keep it. Low key, yeah. So that's cool. All right. Hey, I can appreciate that. But what I find interesting about this is so many people wind up in the situation that you and I both wind up with panic. I'm going to assume panic disorder. Who knows if there was some sort of diagnosis or not, but with this crippling anxiety problem. And they bring into that almost a fear of their emotions. Like there's, it's just too much. I, I shouldn't ever feel anything, but it sounds like you were like, almost like, come on, bring on more. This I, I need to revel in my emotions. Is that where you kind of came from? Like they represent who I am, man. This is, this is, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm a dark person. I think deeply, like you really, you put so much weight into what you thought I'm going to say. Wow, this is brilliant analysis. Yes, I never really had these words said exactly this way. So I did have an official diagnosis of panic disorder, but not until I was 22. But yeah, you know, it was like these feelings were easy for me to handle weirdly. The depressed feelings, they almost um, calmed me and then in a weird way felt brave. Look at me thinking about this stuff. But if I was to have a panic attack, guess who would not be so into death anymore? Yeah. Me, you know? And so it was sort of a way, yeah, to kind of control or like you said, revel in it, feel something. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely that. I was definitely curious about death. Like, gee, what are these uh, panic attacks? Didn't know what they were called. What are these feelings I'm having? Am I okay? And then instead of like, well, I didn't have any resources. I don't know how I would have investigated, but like, mm -hmm. for example, there's a, um, there's a, a class I went to like 20 years ago when I first moved to Los Angeles, because I had such a fear of death that it was overwhelming me. And there was this little um, meditation place and they taught this kind of, I think it's a Buddhist meditation about death mm -hmm. and you meditate and think about your own death and you try to slow your breath and your heart rate down really slowly. And you try to imagine every breath is your last, which sounds really scary. But if I'm thinking about death every five minutes anyway, I might as well do it in a constructive way that actually calms me down and might even help me accept that, um, yes, this will happen someday. And honestly, I don't need to think about it too much in advance because it's yeah. kind of wasting my life. So back to me in the cemetery, I wonder if I was doing some early version of like, let me try to go down this rabbit hole just to see how far I can go, if I can come to any kind of peace with it. I mean, I was not aware I was doing that, but Looking back on it, I bet I was. Maybe. But the interesting thing about that is you run toward your thoughts. Like you are running toward them. I want to think. I want to think deeply. Does that put you in a position? So now you start to have panic attacks. Yeah. And, you know, many, many people, this always fascinates me. If we ever, you know what, if we can crack why this happens, then 
we're going to be just swimming in money. Who knows? But oh, totally. so, so many human beings have panic attacks, even more than one throughout their lives without ever developing a, an anxiety disorder. For whatever reason, they just see them as really unpleasant events and that happen. And then in between, they don't even think about them. But for people like you and me, that didn't happen. So the reason why you don't drive on the highway is you start to be afraid to drive on the highway because you're going to panic and I'm going to panic in the plane. I'm going to panic in the on the second floor of the building or whatever it is. Did you find that being so glued to your thoughts made it difficult? Because in the end, it's like, well, just because I think I'm in danger doesn't mean I am. You have to turn your back on your thinking process. So you were so glued to your thinking process. Was that a struggle for you? Yeah. And, and like you said, you know, when I'm sitting there and thinking about death all the time and you know, I have no idea I'm glued to my thoughts, you know, and I wouldn't have even known there was another way to be in your head. And so what I'm doing when I'm doing that back then is I'm obsessing, even if I think I feel calm, you know, I'm mm. not panicking in those moments, but I'm obsessing so much. I'm creating that neural pathway or something to, uh, it's almost like I'm eating so much sugar, I'm eating so much sugar, so much sugar. And then I get, you know, early onset diabetes or something. I was setting the table for any future panic attack by, um, worrying about this, obsessing about this, and teaching myself to believe my thoughts and getting almost an emotional high from believing my thoughts. I mean, yeah. you know, and so then now when I'm panicking, oh, well, I've done all this uh, exercise that makes me, you know, really strong in this area. Here I go. I'm panicking. You're dying. Yep. I believe that thought because that's what I do. I believe my thoughts. I practice it all the time. And uh, yep, I'm sitting there practicing a fear of death. So immediately my panic attacks are going to go. Some people might think, oh, I'm going to faint. I'm going to be embarrassed. Uh, and I go straight to, oh no, I'm about to cross over into the yeah. great unknown or just drop dead. Yeah. I, and so it was a struggle when I learned, you know, I always say people with anxiety want to control everything except mm -hmm. the one thing they can control, which is their thoughts. It's like, oh, well, that's not, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to control other people and the world and my mortality. So when I learned I could control my thoughts, I was very, um, like, oh, I don't think I could. I have it too bad. Oh, I, and now when I look back on that, that's sort of a defiance. Like, don't take my thoughts from me. That's my safety. You know, it's, it gets all mixed yeah. up. No, this is such a good conversation. When you said I was practicing believing my thoughts and like believing your thoughts and delving into them become part of your identity. And then it puts, you're right. You were a hundred percent setting the table. What I'm yeah. finding fascinating about the difference between you and I, we're pretty close in age. So we get the same references. We grew up around the same time. I was the exact opposite. I never, I never gave my thoughts a second. I was never anxious about anything. I didn't sit in graveyards and, and contemplate the <laughs> mysteries of the universe. Uh, whatever. Like, f but that's okay. You were your way. And I was, there's no, no better or worse here. Yet yeah. we were in the same place. So for me, it was, why am I so tied to these thoughts? It was a completely foreign experience. Just like for you, oh, wait, I don't, I don't have to answer my thoughts was foreign. For me, the idea that I was answering them and engaging with them and like getting caught with them, that was completely like, like a, a colorblind person seeing for the first time colors, you know, no reference frame in that. So, yeah. yeah. So the struggle was completely the opposite for me. We come from two completely different sort of mindsets, but wound up in exactly the same place, which I think tells you there's no discrimination here in the end. Absolutely not. And there's no, um, I was going to say like, the, yeah, there's no discrimination, but there's no like preset. Correct. I don't know. Like if someone has a 12 year old right now and they're like, oh, they're, doing this or they're doing that, that means they will or won't have panic attacks. There's just no, no way to tell. It's how you respond to the first one you have, I guess. And yeah, I'm really first... not all that interested in why the first ones happen as much as some therapists want to go into the childhood, this and that. It's like, that's well, great, but I need to know how to stop this right now. Yeah, I think I call it stopping the bleeding. Like if you show up in the emergency room, the very first thing to do is stop the bleeding. And then we're going to look at what's wrong. So yeah. I would agree. But I, I, you know, I'll speak to that a little bit because I'm I'm kind of vocally not root cause guy. I'm not saying yeah. there isn't. There might be. There might not be. But I was exactly the same way. I People ask me all the time, well, what was the trigger? I still don't know what the trigger is. I might never know. I could have like, ideas. I could guess at it a little bit. But in the end, two people from completely different like emotional states and mental states wind up in exactly the same place. So tell me again why everybody has to dig for a cause because we could not have been any different yet we wind up with the same disorder and actually come out of it the same way. So uh, I'm not, I didn't invite you on to prove that there's no root cause, but I think it really does illustrate experiences vary so widely, but in the yeah. end, 
the mechanism of recovery turns out to be common even across two people that don't have much in common, probably in terms of our thinking style and our emotional style. Yeah, well, it's interesting we too, because I did, um, when I first, first, first went to therapy for this panic, I did very cognitive behavioral based therapy, but then I moved out of the city I was living in mm -hmm. and I didn't know I was doing CBT. So I just knew I'm doing therapy. I don't know. So then right. I move away and don't do therapy for a year and uh, you know, tools are getting rusty. Let me brush up. And I go to a new therapist in a new city and she's very, what's the cause? She kept asking, what is the thought you have before you panic? I said, I, I could not tell you if you pay me, well, carry this journal. Why are you in denial? And it was like, look lady, eventually I just lied. Oh, I thought this, you know, so that it would make <laughs> sense to her. So we could just move on to get to the, what do I do about it? And I did 10 years of root cause and it Ouch. didn't change anything. And then I did on my own, and, and brought it to this therapist that I was still with was like, I need to do like w workbook, textbook stuff, you yeah. know? And, yeah. and uh, so anyway, my point is, and yes, root cause for where did I learn, um, you know, anxious thoughts or where did I learn kind of catastrophizing? Like, yeah, sure, my parents did it, but that doesn't mean I was going to have panic attacks. You know, it means that later on when I had more time, uh, because I wasn't panicking every second. And I went, how come I look at this so negatively? Oh, I learned that from my parents. Uh, they did the best they could. But I think I heard stuff like this around the house. Oh, I'm just going to, well, now what do I really think? Oh, let me change my thinking. That to me has zero to do with helping me in a physical moment of panic. It, it is two separate things. And, you know, if you never get the chance to work on where this and that came from, you'll still get the recovery if you do the things you're supposed to do for um, overcoming, you know, yeah. ruminations and physical feelings. It's that difference between, and, and, you know, emotions can cause reactions and that's fine. And, and sometimes we have to work on those things. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it really does become the difference between I'm anxious or I'm afraid or I'm feeling, I'm remembering things that are traumatic for me or painful for me. And I'm afraid of feeling that that's the difference. Yeah. I'm afraid of feeling that. that anybody who listens to this podcast has heard me say that 10,000 times. <laughs> Uh, you're just such a good, uh, to me, the two of us are a really good illustration of how, I don't know how that hell that happens, but you two people who wind up in exactly the same place coming from totally different directions in a way, except that, you know, we both probably watch the same TV shows, but we other, probably, as, as I'm thinking about it more with all that's going on in the world, I'm thinking of nuclear war movies from the eighties. We probably watched uh, a lot of those <laughs> day after and those. Yeah. Like, and there was some scary shit that that's true during that time. Yeah. We were under the nuclear threat all the time, which is odd to be talking about that today given right, yeah. the world at the moment. But um, yeah, I think that's true. Yet I kind of like, I don't know. Some people would have said, well, I was, you know, they, they probably look at me and like, well, what were you dead? Were you a robot? Well, maybe in a little bit, I was a little bit armor plated for a long time. And then I wasn't, you know, and like, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't armor plated, but I, you know what? And I, I can, I've said this many, many times for my listeners know this. I'm happy. I'm not armor plated anymore. Like being coated in titanium and never getting anxious was not a natural state to be in. So yes. if you look at the way you were and maybe the way you've come out on the other side and that evolution, what's different now? Like, did you, do you want to be sitting on a gravestone in black smoking cigarettes anymore? Or is it better to have this mix of, yeah, this, this process, what did this process teach you? You know, how do you think you're better today than you were then because of it? Yeah. It's interesting. Like sitting in this cemetery wearing all black and smoking is as much of a defense as I don't have any feelings. Right. It was like, um, sure. and yeah, there was a while when I just, I never tried to, but I looked at other people that didn't seem anxious and who didn't seem to have any reactions to things in life. And I just really longed to be one of them. Why couldn't I have come out that way? And now I realize, ooh, I don't want that either. Um, it's sort of like now I can handle feeling my feelings or feeling scared and I don't like it. But there's such a difference between I don't like this to I'm dying. This is killing me. This is dangerous. Yeah. And so you know, what I, the biggest, greatest visual or it's not visual, but whatever concrete example I can give is now when I get on an airplane, I don't like turbulence. It makes me kind of queasy. Sometimes I throw up, 
you know, it, bo- it just bothers me. I like to work and write on planes and the, the coffee's shaking and it's just more annoying than anything. And, and sometimes it, you know, it doesn't scare me like, oh, I'm going to die, but it does get my nervous system a little rattled. I think our body is like, hey, what's happening? And sure. so I never feel great after I get off a bumpy flight, but none of that is terror and going, I'm dying. It's more like now I get to have all the inconveniences that normal people do, you know? Nothing is uh, an avoidance of feeling, but I get to have just right-sized normal reactions to things. Yeah, which is interesting because I think when we're in the thick of it, I remember looking at people, I would sometimes even look at my kids at the time, my kids were small and I would think, I would just love to be like them. They were just like, well, they're not thinking about anything. But in the end, then you discover when you come out the other side, like, oh, those people were not always, they were had their own issues and everybody feels a little anxiety and uncertainty and emotions and uh, I used to have major like issue I'd be terrified of it. I didn't sleep which I still don't sleep but at that point like oh if I don't get enough sleep my anxiety will be through the roof and I, I was trapped in that cycle I remember looking at a woman in a parking lot one morning she got out of the car and she looked like she had been dragged through the night I my apologies <laughs> ma'am whoever you are but she just looked exhausted and yet yeah. she got out of her car and she walked in and she got a cup of coffee and she got in her car and probably went to work and she was not feeling great I'm sure but she didn't care And I came to realize like, oh, that's where I need to be. Not perfectly feeling great, just capable of feeling anything. Yeah, I mean, the opposite of feeling utter dread and panic is obviously not feeling nothing. But I definitely probably thought that for a while. Like, that's the goal. You know, just be, quote, normal as though there's this, like, factory setting that everyone feels. And I think that would be comforting to think there's a right way to be. So let me just work towards that. And then you find out, oh, there's no right way to be. You just want to be able to, you know, sit with your uncomfortable feelings. It's like, I wouldn't yeah. tell someone that right up front who's, <laughs> you no, know, you're like, you don't want to scare them. Like, oh, don't, you know, you never fully recover in the sense you can't, my therapist once said you can't recover from being human. So uh-huh, that's a good line. I like it. I'm going to steal yeah. that for sure. Steal. Um, excellent conversation. We're going to hit about the 25 minute mark where I like to cut it off or else we just fall off the cliff. Because I understand people have a lot of time to listen to these, <laughs> but you, what do you have like parting thoughts here? You did you asked me, so I'm going to ask you. If somebody is if somebody was you, if you can relate to Jen, like Jen, what would you tell you? What would you tell past you? Huh, I would say there's nothing wrong with you. You can enjoy your dramatic whatever as long as you're having fun with it. Like, are you having any fun? Or, or if you're not, then you're probably feeding the wrong. I don't know what thing in your brain. Like, I think I just froze. No, no, you're good. No, okay. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would, I know that sounds really trite, but are you, are you enjoying this? And if you're not, why are you doing it all the time? And uh, if you honestly think that you are the only one that's ever had this, just know that that is probably the biggest symptom of all of this. And you know. I won't go so far as to call you a narcissist, young Jen, but I will say you really can't get out of yourself right now and you need some help doing it. And there's people who are trained to do this. Go find them. You can't get out of yourself. That is outstanding. That was worth the price of admission right there. Oh, wait. Now, you wanted to talk about one more thing because you said. I, oh, I did want to talk about Thank you so much. I owe I'm you just going to bring it up that you said that no one believes yes. you. Yes. Okay. Should I so, tell you what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's do it. So I didn't, I forgot all about it. So thank you. One of the things before Jen goes into her little wrap up here, cause this is important that the community all the time, like, Oh my God, I thought I was, so when I share like, Oh, I used to be afraid of this. I used to be afraid of that. Oh my God. I thought I was the only one shoot. What were you afraid of? During a panic attack, when those feelings start to happen and you start to feel like, Oh my God, I, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. My biggest fear was I'm going to lose Gravity. Gravity will not affect me. Not everyone else. I literally feared I was going to fly away full body up into the atmosphere. And it was so real. Just you, not everybody else. Just me. You you are. And when when we were recording, you can, I know, you know, you you saw me. I literally, I couldn't contain my excitement when you said that. Not because I wanted you to be afraid, of course. (laughs) So many people feel like their fear is the craziest. They're ashamed. Like, I can't Mm -hmm. say what my fear is. And I will always say, like, you can't you can't tell me a fear that I think is going to be crazy at all, because I've heard all of them. I had only heard one person before that was afraid that gravity was going to stop working. You are the second. So it doesn't matter what you're afraid of. Brains can create amazing, beautiful genius and also the biggest steaming piles of shit that we can imagine. Mm -hmm. 
that is amazing. And th- how did that how did that go away? Did it just as you're well? I'll let it you didn't. Say. I mean, to be honest, if I'm outside and going to panic attack, if I'm hiking and suddenly I realize, oh, I'm alone here and oh my God, it just the just sort of the way the view works and hits my brain, yeah. I will start to have that feeling I'm losing gravity. And I honestly, I just let it happen. And then I tell myself, it's literally impossible. It's literally impossible. It's literally impossible. And then I get creative and say, well, if you did and you survived, you are going to be like, huge you're gonna write a book about it like you're just gonna be tested by scientists like you are very special you know this is gonna be huge just get down the hill and just breathe but it's ironic though because when you're in an airplane if i were to lose gravity all i would do is just hit my head on the ceiling it would be no big deal it's not like i'm gonna blow through the plane so oh okay it's it's, it's weird that um that that used to freak me out in an airplane i'm going to lose gravity all right well i'm inside but when I'm outside, it happens as well. So it still happens once in a while. But I just do all those things. I try to get creative and say, yeah, maybe you will. And you can write a book about it. Yeah, see, that, that's really cool. Those are shades of kind of ERP work there. Like, I'm going to go toward it and play with it then. Uh, some people take their scary thoughts and write little songs about them and sing them to themselves and play the guitar. So there's all kinds of creative ways. But I love how specific your brain got. Like, off of an inside, oh, who cares? Because I'll just, I'll just kind of hit the ceiling and it'll be okay. But yeah, it, that's how I call myself. I, yeah, yeah, it's it's <laughs> our brains are amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for remembering because I wanted to put it out there because I know somebody's going to hear that and go like, "Oh my god!" And by the way, if you have that fear of gravity, put it in the comments on YouTube or email me or something because I that's oh I that's, know I want to meet my people. Second person ever ever heard, and I've been at this for quite a long time, so that blew me off my chair when you said that you had the gravity. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. So of course. Anyway. Tell us a little bit about Anxiety Bites, what that's all about. And I will give you all the links to Jen's podcast and everything else when we're done here. But tell us about the podcast. Yeah, it's free wherever you get your podcast. Um, and I, once a week, uh, episodes come out and I interview someone, whether it's a neuroscientist or a therapist or someone like yourself who is helping others with anxiety. And we talk about anxiety. I try to normalize it. There are swears. It's not, you know, I'm not a self-help guru. I'm just another person with anxiety who wants to learn more about it and my intention is it, it's for people who know nothing and just want to hear all of the different ways that anxiety affects us and maybe see from there if it's something they want to explore more. Or if it's the veteran who's had anxiety forever and kind of loves listening about it, might hear something they needed to hear that day. So Anxiety Bites, hosted by me. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to do anything to help normalize it. And if I can help one person that was as scared as I was when I was younger and didn't know where to turn, then then I'm happy. It's really good. It's a great podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, I have it up on the screen right now. You go to jenkirkman.com slash anxiety bites podcast and go check it out or find it wherever you get your podcast. But I'll give you all the links uh, in the wrap up when we're done. Jen, thank you so much. Maybe you'll come on again one time. We'd love to have you open invite. Anytime. I'm sure there's a lot more fears I could tell you about. I'll have to think about. Yeah. Anytime. Official apologies to Morrissey, by the way, if you're listening, get a bit. You really <laughs> probably is. Yeah, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. Anyway, thanks, guys. And uh, I'll be back in a second to wrap it up. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Okay, we are back wrapping up after that interview with Jen Kirkman. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed talking to Jen. We're going to try and have her back on the podcast from time to time when she can squeeze it in. Like I said, she's super busy. If you want to find Jen, you can find her Anxiety Bites podcast, like she said, anywhere that you can find podcasts or have it up on the screen on YouTube. You can go to jenkirkman.com slash anxiety bites to find the podcast. If you just want to find all Jen's links more conveniently, just go to the anxious truth.com slash one nine eight, which is the show notes and the links for this episode. And that is it. That is episode one ninety eight wrapped up in a nutshell. You know, it's over because music <laughs> that is afterglow by my friend, Ben Drake. And you can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. Thank you again, Ben, for letting me use the song. I, I appreciate you, man. Go check him out and tell him I said, hello. And uh, yeah, if you are digging the podcast and you're listening on iTunes or Spotify or someplace where you can rate and review, rate it five stars and then maybe take a minute and write a quick review of the podcast so it helps other people find it. And that's why I do this to try and help as many people as I can. And if you're watching on YouTube, hey, YouTube, again, (laughs) just hit the uh, subscribe button, like the video, leave a comment. I'm having a good time actually being active with you guys on YouTube these days over the past month or so. It's been really great to sort of comment with you guys there in a different environment. So leave a comment and a question on the video if you're watching on video, and I will answer it, I promise. And that's it. We are out. I do not know what I'm going to be talking about next week, but I can tell you that I will, in fact, be here. And as I am so want to remind you every week, keep moving forward because this is the way. This is where your story begins. 
You got the feeling that you're gonna win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance. So go and live your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push through the pressure.